Okay, so good morning. Let me take you through the saga of space exploration. So there is a great quotation by a famous visionary. The limits of the possible can only be defined if we go beyond them into the impossible. And this great visionary has written uh, a lot of things. He has predicted the future. And one of his uh, great predictions which has come true is that if we put three satellites in geostationary orbit covering the Earth, then you can have global communications. And do you know who he was? It was Arthur C. Clarke. And he has written so much which is still continuing to inspire us. His talks are inspiring millions of people. Now suppose one wants to go and explore space. What, what are the possibilities by which one can do? We know that chemical rockets take us out of Earth into orbit. And if you want to go beyond Earth orbit, there are many ways by which one can do it. The first thing is, if you have bigger and bigger rockets, you can go further. You can put bigger and bigger spacecrafts to orbit. I'm sure you all know about the Saturn V. Long back, it has put man to the moon. And then, now we have one big rocket which is in the news. That is the Falcon Heavy. That's currently in service. ISRO's own PSLV is actually a small rocket. And it was originally meant to put satellites in orbit around Earth only. But we have extended this mission so that we are able to go to Moon and also to Mars. We had the Chandrayaan-1. We had the Mars Orbiter mission. So how was this made possible? It was made possible only by having an ingenious mission planning. And that's what I would like to talk to you about. Now, suppose you are looking at a conventional mission planning. Suppose you want to go to Mars. Then what do you do? You take off from the Earth in a rocket, go around Earth. The spacecraft is moving around Earth. At that time, what influences the motion of the spacecraft? It is the gravitational pull of the Earth. Then from there, you take off. Then you go into orbit around the Sun. And you are in a heliocentric orbit, then you reach near Mars. Once you reach near Mars, then Mars will capture it and you go into orbit around Mars. So you can see that at different times during this travel, different heavenly bodies are influencing the spacecraft. Basically two bodies, one is the spacecraft and the Earth, then later on there is the spacecraft and the Sun, finally there is the spacecraft and Mars. So this is Actually, this is called a two-body problem. And Newton has given a very nice solution to this two-body problem. All our conventional rockets, their paths are defined by this two-body problem. And when you have so many heavenly bodies, what do you do? You go from one set to another set to another set. And you see there is an ellipse. There is a hyperbola. Again, there is an ellipse. Again, a hyperbola. Again, an ellipse. So these are all called conic sections. And this is called a patched conic approximation. This is what we usually do. Now with this way of planning, it is very simple and it is very elegant. But there is a problem that you need a lot of fuel. It is a very fuel intensive approach. So there is a limitation to how much you can go. You want to go and explore the very ends of the solar system. So there is one very successful mission which has actually gone to the edge of the solar system and that is the Voyager mission. Voyager mission started much before any of you were born. And those two small spacecrafts are now at the edge, very edge of the solar system. One has already crossed the solar system and it has gone into interstellar space. And that mission itself has been renamed. It is now called the Voyager Interstellar Mission. And the other one is almost reaching there. That also will soon cross and it will go into outer space. So how was this made possible when we have such severe limitations? In fact, the Voyager mission was made possible because of a very special celestial event. And this event happens only once in 175 years, where all the outer planets get aligned, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and also Pluto. They all get aligned 
in such a way that the gravitational pull of each of these planets can be used to assist the spacecraft on its outward journey. And uh, that is a very successful mission. And we could gain a lot of information about our outer planets by the Voyager mission. But as I already said, it is only once in 175 years. You cannot wait so much time to go on an exploration. If you want to colonize outer planets, then you have to start soon. So what is the solution? You cannot use this approach. So it turns out that actually there are some low energy pathways which are hidden in the solar system. So I just wanted to share with you this information because you are the children of the future and all interplanetary space travel will be occurring during your lifetime. So it turns out that there are some very special regions in space. Suppose you are in orbit around the Earth. You want to go and observe the Sun. So basically now there are three bodies, two heavenly bodies and your spacecraft. One is the Earth, another is the Sun, and the third is your spacecraft. So if you are considering these three bodies together, there are some five special regions in space where you will get some very special properties and these regions are actually called Lagrange points. Okay? And they are named after a very famous mathematician of the 18th century. His name was Lagrange. But it was not just he who discovered this. At the same time, there was another mathematician, Euler. I'm sure you're all familiar with Euler's name. Euler also discovered three of these points. And they both shared the prize which was offered for its discovery by the Parisian Academy of Sciences. And do you think that Euler could not do as much as Lagrange did? Lagrange found five, Euler found only three. Actually, his achievement was a very remarkable achievement because he did the entire mathematics. It was a complex mathematics. He did the entire mathematics in his head. He was totally blind at the time. So it shows what the human mind is capable of, doesn't it? So once this was found out, even the mathematicians themselves had no idea of what it would mean for space travel. But what it actually means is that, suppose you take a spacecraft and put it at any one of these points. It can simply remain there. It does not need any further fuel to keep it in that point. You can simply sit there and simultaneously see the two heavenly bodies. Suppose you want to observe the sun and you put a spacecraft at one of the Lagrange points for the Earth-Sun system, you can continue to observe the sun. Or you want to make a space station, you can take all the components, put it there and assemble it. So there are many, many uses of these Lagrange points in the space business. And you can also have some low energy paths from one point to the other. And this is what is going to enable uh, low fuel phase travel. And this property which we get is actually coming because of a special effect. It is called the butterfly effect. I don't know how many of you are aware of the butterfly effect. Suppose a butterfly is flapping its wings in one country. Oh, let us say it is in New Mexico. It is a standard example used. And you see a hurricane in China. Is there any relation between these two events? Actually, it is there. Because there are certain systems where if you give a very small change in the initial conditions, leads to a large change in the outcome. So this is actually called the butterfly effect. And this butterfly effect is applicable for all, all chaotic systems. Such systems are called chaotic systems. You give a small change in the initial condition, it gives large response. And space also, especially in the vicinity of these Lagrange points, space is chaotic. And that's a good news for us. If you can give a small push, then you can get your spacecraft to go huge distances without any further expenditure of fuel. So I was talking about two heavenly bodies and some five special regions. And the entire solar system has so many heavenly bodies 
you have a lot of planets, all of them are orbiting the sun. So many satellites are there orbiting each of these planets and each of these will have series of orbits around them. They are actually in the form of tubes or they are called manifolds. And once you have all of this, what we really get is really a big, it's called an interplanetary superhighway or it can be called an interplanetary transport network also. It is something which is really invisible to our eyes, but it is lying hidden in the solar system. And because we have this huge network, you can very easily go from one planet to another with a very minimum expenditure of energy. Suppose you are in Earth orbit, say. You can see Earth there. It is somewhere in the middle. The blue dot in the middle is the Earth. You want to go to Jupiter. So there is a very easy pathway which you can take. You can see it goes round the Earth. Then it goes via Mars. And then you give a push. Then it comes round and then it goes through Jupiter. And this is such, so many paths are there. This is one illustration how one can do this. It is something like our ancestors used to do long back when if a log had to be transported from a mountain down to the plain, they used to cut it and put it into a stream. Now the stream will be taking it along with its flow. After some time, the stream will come and join a river. And at the junction, you give a very small push, then you'll get into the flow of the river without very, very little expenditure of energy one can get it down to the plains. This was one method which we have used on the earth and that is equally applicable in space also. So one can use this network. Is it really practically possible? Because all, it's very easy to talk about things in theory and in the air, but is it actually possible? Actually the answer is yes. Not just is it possible, it has been already done. And I would just like to share with you one or two very remarkable missions. The first one, it's really a saga of endurance. You can see when it started. It started in 1978. None of you were born at that time. And this was a mission which went to explore the sun. It wanted to ex observe the sun. So it was sent to one of these special points from where you could sit and observe the sun. So it did all that. It finished its fuel also, not fully, almost completely its fuel was exhausted. At that point, the scientists who were in charge of the mission, they thought, okay, it's time for this to take a new avatar. They renamed it as an international cometary explorer. And you know the comets, they come and go once in a while. And this particular spacecraft was redirected and it went and intercepted the tail of a planet. That is. This is the very first time a spacecraft could actually go and directly investigate the tail of a planet, the very first time. And it did not stop with that. Afterwards, the second comet, which is very familiar to most of you, it's called Halley's Comet. It was the first time we could directly explore two comets. You must imagine that all this was done with a spacecraft which had almost no fuel left. And afterwards, it continued on its journey it came back to Earth, near in the vicinity of Earth in 2014. You remember, I started off with 1978. Now we have reached 2014. At this time, a group of scientists thought, okay, let us see whether it's still working. They could establish communication with it. It was still working. Five of its science payloads were still working. It has gone back now, and it is in orbit around the sun, and it is again going to come back to the vicinity of Earth in 2031. So you can see that it is possible to use these pathways and it has already been done, not just once, it has been done more number of times also. So there's just one more mission I would like to tell you about and that is this Genesis mission. In fact, this mission is a much more recent mission and they desired, they knew already that such a highway is existing and they designed the entire path on the computer using very complex math much before this mission was launched. So if a ball is simply pushed up, what will happen? It will come down. And it's simply under the influence of gravity. What you did, you gave only the initial push. You didn't do anything else. 
In fact, this entire mission was planned like that. You fling something out into space, it goes all around, then it comes back without any further expenditure of energy. And it really worked. So it was pushed out, it went, it went and explored the sun, then it went to the other side and explored another. There are two Lagrange points on both sides. So it went to the other side, it came back to Earth also. So it shows that there are such exciting possibilities out there. And this interplanetary superhighway, it is going to be the cornerstone of our future explorations. You can send cargo along this, because it takes more time. All the cargo can go one after the other in this path. Humans can go in fast rockets. Humans can reach the destination first, or maybe one cargo would have been sent in advance. Then you keep on getting what you need, more like a good strain. So, so the, we are really opening a new chapter in space exploration, and this I wanted to share with you. Thank you.